Each episode, we bring you B2B leaders to learn about their successes, fails, and what's working for them in the market. Before we get into today's episode, we have a quick announcement. We just dropped the first in-depth study into account-based marketing in the region. Together with the independent research company, Shift Research Group, we surveyed more than 50 senior APAC marketing practitioners to uncover ABM usage, motivations, benefits, and pain points across the Asia-Pacific region. Along with a panel of ABM experts, we provide actionable insight, optimization techniques, and solutions to key pain points identified in the survey. The State of Account-Based Marketing APAC report is an invaluable guide for B2B marketers seeking to harness the power of ABM. Get your copy today at abm.xgrowth.com.au forward slash report. That's abm.xgrowth.com.au forward slash report. Or you can just hit the link in the podcast description to get your copy. That's enough from me. Let's dive right into today's episode. I'm Shaheen Hoda with Xgrowth. And today I'm talking to Paul Gibson, Vice President of International at Demandbase about how to recession proof your marketing strategy with account-based marketing and account-based experience. On that note, let's dive in. Paul, thanks for joining us. Good morning. Yeah, nice to speak to you. I'm looking forward to this session. No, same over here. And good morning to you from, uh, from uh, UK. We're here down, down under. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm super excited for us to have a chat about this, especially at this time where for, for, for people who are kind of listening, this is the end of uh, Q2 and things are a little bit volatile in, in the market in terms of what is happening or we're going through a recession or things are going to be okay. It's not very clear. Paul, what are you seeing? How are you seeing this volatility impacting B2B marketers? Yeah, that's a, that's a, a great starter point. And it, it's a really interesting time right now, I think, with, with the economy. I don't know what it is like, as you say, down under, but it's certainly seeming fragile here. And, and the war in Ukraine has created some real uncertainty. I think it's fair to say, though, the B2B space is pretty resilient, and it's become more, more so than ever over the last couple of years. If, if we think back to covid B2B sales and marketing teams have really had to completely change the way they work. There's, there were trade shows, field events, face-to-face meetings that were traditionally lead generation areas, and they, saw, they all stopped, right? But prospects were still trying to solve problems, trying to buy products. Now they're all doing it digitally. And so B2B businesses had to find a way to identify those buyers or they'd risk out missing those opportunities that they could probably win altogether. Uh, And intent suddenly became that big buzzword. How do I identify those buying signals? But that was only really the start. If I am able to identify those buyers, how can I ensure they know us? How do I know they know our brand? They know we can help them. So hyper-targeted advertising became really a perfect solution. But let's not throw random adverts out there and hope that some of it hits. Let's focus on those companies that we've now identified are in market and that we know that we can sell to. And so getting in front of them earlier than normal, which is the the result of that, and actually being able to influence them at the beginning of their buyer journey, didn't just ensure those opportunities were found, but it also actually accelerated the buying cycles. So by the time they got to the salesperson, they already understood the USPs of that business, the value being offered. And sales actually got into position, they were closing deals faster. And by the way, although we're coming out of COVID, we we think that behavior is is now ingrained in most buyers. So the tactics have had to continue. I think what's new this year is is that changing economic situation where there's lots of uncertainty, budget cuts, resource reductions. Plus, businesses still need to sell their products and services, right? They still need to hit their numbers. So there's a lot of talk out there about cutting back things like marketing. Our our view isn't you shouldn't stop marketing. You just need to get smarter about it. A simple example, it amazes me how much time, budget, and resources still wasted on companies that a business can't even sell to in places where their ICP accounts don't go and probably importantly, their brand doesn't really want to be seen. So yeah, it's, it's really interesting times. I think the world has evolved a lot over the last couple of years from a digital perspective. Now it's becoming smarter and more effective so that that reduced budget time and resources is spent in the right places. Interesting. Interesting. So, I mean, you talked about 
So you're, you're obviously seeing at your end that budgets are getting caught and you're having those conversations. Is, is that is that right? Yeah, it seems to be um, anywhere in the media you lead, uh, you look now, it's, I don't know if the media is the same in Australia, but we seem to get more negative by the day. No one talks about good news anymore. And, and I think it's starting to to filter through to people sitting there going, right, if, you know, our cost of living has, has risen quite dramatically, there's, you know, you, you look at a, a petrol prices now, they've doubled over the last couple of months. And everyone and everywhere you look is going, oh, okay, we need to be cutting back on things. And I think that's that's probably a mistake. It needs to be, as I say, smarter, not 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 less, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, positive doesn't sell as well uh, as negative. So, uh, you know, I, I think that's that's why we're hearing all this negative news. So let's let's talk about getting smarter about your marketing strategy. I mean, you touched on some of these where you you talked about intent, you talked about hyper targeted ads, you talked about targeting the people that are in the market, right? Let's let's dive a little bit deeper into those. And you know, if I'm a marketer sitting at or uh, well, most likely sitting at home these days, but um, looking at my budget and things are, are, are potentially going to be cut or there's going to be some downsizing, whatever it is. But now I, I, I still have to get results. Where do I start? Where do I, you know, what, what do I, what should I, what should, what is your advice for what I as a marketer should do kind of make sure I hit my end of, end of year targets? Yeah. That, and I think that's the, that, that's the point we're all at at the moment. If I've got less, how do I still hit the same results? And it, it's obviously a challenge, but I think there's some key things. And by the way, I think every, everything we're talking about now, and we'll, we'll probably touch on it a little bit later on, it's as important for sales as it is marketing, this, this, this whole approach now. So we talked about getting smarter. And what do I mean by that? I suppose a really simple example. Pretty much everyone we talk to, and I'm sure it's the same with you, spend money on advertising, right? It's the way you get out in front of those people and um, ensure that, that you're not missing those opportunities. But it's amazing how much of it is thrown out there blindly. Advertising to companies that they can't sell to, maybe even competition, you know, the competition in places their brands really don't want to be seen because they're not brand safe places. <laughs> it's, it's probably a strange thought process, but I don't know why a CFO would ever sign off a budget to target a company that their business couldn't sell to. I mean, but that's what so many companies do, right? It, it's actually it's because sometimes they'll get a bite from that company that they can't sell to, and salespeople, being natural human beings, will go after that. Um, they're highly unlikely to be successful if in that particular deal, but if they are, it's a deal that's smaller than the, the company ideally wants because it's not a great fit, and you have to fit that square pig in square peg into a round hole. Uh, the client experience is going to be poor because it's not a great fit. They probably won't renew, which isn't a great thing for the business. So all around, it's a bad idea. I always think of a, a simple example. If you're in the B to C world and you sell boots, you know, footwear, and I see that you're showing buying signals, I want to get in front of you because I can see that you're in the market for boots. But anyone who has, has feet will potentially be in the market for boots. So it makes sense for me to advertise here, there and everywhere because there may be someone else who's looking for boots that I just haven't identified, but would be a good fit. That's not the same in the B2B world. If I'm in a company that can sell technology to IT companies, but not to retailers, where is the benefit in me spending advertising budget and, and marketing time and resource advertising to the largest retailers in the country? They may be big, but I can't sell to them. So it doesn't make sense. So, so our view is very much that Every minute, every dollar and every element of your sales and marketing resource should be focused only on those good fit accounts that you can actually sell to. Uh, the result will probably be a smaller pipeline, but a much stronger pipeline of opportunities that, that will close faster at a higher average order value and deliver improved close rates. And that's what we're all trying to achieve, right? Marketing would be happy because sales love them. The alignment is much better because they know that they're influencing and providing leads from com uh, companies that they can sell to. Sales love it because their time spent on good fit companies, they know they can close. And the business is happy, of course, because it means more deals are closing faster at a higher rate, and there's much less wasted in the business. Asking a, a CFO, can I have $100,000 for advertising next year, is what we traditionally hear being done. But the CFO never turns around and says, well, how much of that is being spent on companies we can sell to and how many not? And it amazes me because CFOs can, you know, they're so tight with all other budgets, yet things like that, they seem to go, yeah, yeah, you want 100 grand, have it. So I think if we're going to have less resources, budget, et cetera, this year, we need to make 
every element count and avoid the wastage that goes on in the business. So that, that's, that's sort of where we're coming from there. That's interesting. So, you know, in a lot of, a lot of the kind of literature of how marketing should market internally, meaning that, hey, I'm a marketer inside of an organization and I have to kind of sell what I'm doing internally as well. A lot of the literature around that is that, hey, don't get technical. Speak really high level. Don't get into the details. But are you suggesting that, you know, me as a marketer, I should start to go into some of the more granular detail of ABM and showing the CFO or whoever it is that, 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 that is approving the budget to show how granular one can get with ABM? Is that, is that what you're suggesting? In, in part, but I think it's uh, a, a really interesting topic, which again comes up a lot of times. So, again, I'm, I'm referring a lot of this to, to the advertising area, but really it, it comes across the board in terms of marketing. You think about how most marketers prove the success of their, their campaigns and efforts to a business. They'll sit in a meeting and they say, we had a click-through rate of 0.7% and we delivered a million impressions. Yes. Okay, I suppose in the cold light of day, that might mean something to someone. But in reality, they are at, at worst um, hidden figures because they're never able to say who clicked on that advert. They'll never be able to say where those impressions were delivered and who to. So if I'm a salesperson or a sales leader and I'm sat there trying to get this sales and marketing alignment going and I've got these 400 companies that I know we can sell to and and uh, I really want to see what the effectiveness of our campaigns is on those 400 companies. And all I get is, well, we got a click-through rate of 0.7% and delivered a million impressions. Does that really help me? Absolutely not. It, you know, and, and I think a lot of that is driven from the B2C world, right? Where if you're a B2C uh, DSP, you know, delivering ads, the idea is I want to send as many as impressions as I can to as many people in as many places as possible because they're all working on that that example I gave around boots that everyone can buy them so let's send it to everyone and see what happens in a b2b world that simply isn't the case so saying I got a click-through rate of 0.7 percent but not being able to say who clicked on it really is a, the old b2c world which in the b2c world works b2b is I'm not saying lazy as the word but has got into their routine of doing the same things and that's because primarily they use a B2C DSP. Now, as I say, by their very nature, they want to show you how many impressions they've delivered and how many clicks. That's all they care about. If you ask them, okay, well, how many of them were from our target companies and, and where, where did you deliver those impressions? It, it's either they can't tell you because they're just throwing them over or they won't tell you because they know that a big percentage of that will not be from companies you can sell to. So if you flip that round and have an account-based approach to advertising, like you, you, you know anyone who's adopting ABM, ABX is trying to do elsewhere, you need to be able to sit there and say, right, for that company that you asked me to go after, in the last month, I've delivered X impressions. I've spent that much budget on them. But the result I've seen from that particular company is that they've now hit our website 27 times. Four people saw that really relevant piece of content. That's now an opportunity. They're in with sales and they've had three meetings with sales. That is what I mean by delivering back to the business something that makes sense to the business. Sales, marketing, anyone can sit there and say, okay, those campaigns are being really effective because they're hitting those companies that we're interested and we can sell to, and they're moving them through the, the, uh, the sales funnel quicker than they t traditionally were, et cetera. Right. I see your point. I see your point. Paul, let's change gear a little bit and also talk about sales. I want to I wanna make sure that we cover both because in the B2B world, as we both know, I mean, you can't really accomplish much with sales alone or marketing alone. Really, like maybe you can accomplish some, but, but the combination of the two, the results could be absolutely amazing. What are your thoughts in terms of from a sales perspective and what, how are things changing from, from, from that landscape? uh right now we talked about marketing but definitely it would be would be good to uh, touch on sales as well absolutely and one of the, the things that's changed i think in the last year or so is the acronym abm it's still around right but it very much seemed to focus purely on marketing and really that account-based approach should work with anyone in a go-to market type role so that'll be not just marketing but that'll be demand gen that'll be sales that'll be post sales the customer success teams etc because to, to the same you know, point of view, if your, if your account-based approach is 
how you're working in every element of the business, it's going to be much more successful. Now, take it from the point of view of a sales leader. If I know that my sales team can sell to, let's say they have a, a quite a niche product, to 200 companies out there in the, in the marketplace, they want to know that marketing is spending all of their time, budget and resource on those 200 companies and not wasting it anywhere else, as we just spoke about. But the result of that is phenomenal for the sales team because if I'm a salesperson and let's say uh, in a cynical world, the leads I'm getting from marketing aren't really very good. They're not a good fit. They're not, never in market. I spend probably half my time doing my own research. And as a salesperson, I should be out there selling, not researching. So if the sales leader sits there and he sees that half the time his sales are chasing after opportunities that aren't a good fit, they're not closing many deals, they're spending a lot of time researching because they're trying to find their own stuff because marketing aren't throwing anything decent over the fence type thing. That's frustrating, right? And the result is normally, you know, not closing as fast as we want. It, deals are getting stuck. Deals that are closing aren't big enough value, so you need more new logos. The close rates aren't sufficient. So from a sales leader, if I, if I was able to know that my marketing efforts in my team's were focusing on those companies and therefore delivering a pipeline of opportunities that are good fit in market and likely to close because they're, they're companies that we're, we're aware of, that's going to be fantastic. If I also know that the marketing team are getting influence far earlier in the buyer journey of those prospects, that means they're much more likely to want to engage with us. And if we've got involved earlier and are influencing from the beginning of that research, when they do become an opportunity for sales, they already understand our USPs. They understand the value we offer. And therefore, I'm going to close that deal much quicker and likely keep the value higher because I've been selling value from the beginning. The other element which is really important is, as a salesperson, I'll probably know two or three people in those, those business. They'll be critical people for us, but we all know in the B2B world, the buyer committee is maybe 8, 10, 12 people. And we'll never get to speak or know who all of them are. But they'll all be involved in that decision. They'll be doing lots of research on and off of our website. And it's really important for marketing to be able to identify, reach out to those people and share the same story and messaging that sales are having with those two or three we know. So when it comes to the entire buying committee making that decision, whether sales are, are spoken to them or not, they're on message. They understand you're a brand they should deal with. They know it's a really good fit. And therefore, it's a much more higher likelihood of close. So I think this stuff we're talking about today is obviously it's a marketing based thing, but it's also a sales based thing. Anyone who has a go to market approach should be ensuring that their business is spending all their time, budget and resource only on those companies that can be closed. I love it. I mean, the message is very clear, right? The message is you, you have to get more targeted with your approach as the budget tightens. Absolutely. And, and yeah, yeah. So did you want to say something on that, Paul? Yeah, what I was going to say is I think we've all got comfortable as, as marketers of, of knowing that we're going to advertise in this particular way and we just do it. We've never really had, maybe it's the, the confidence or being brave enough to really dig into it and say, is that being effective? And we, we should all be sitting there now and, and thinking, not just because of this podcast, but sitting there thinking with budgets being re reduced and resources tightening and things like that okay, you're telling me I've got a, I'm getting these click-through rates or whatever it may be. Who is it who's clicking on it? What is the result that I'm actually getting? How, how can I go back to the business and say what I'm doing is being successful? And if you can't get that, you need to find ways of doing it because it, it's, it's no longer good enough to have those, I think people call them vanity metrics that marketing had traditionally had have got on the back of high-fiving on high CTRs and things like that, when really that, that doesn't prove that it's anything like successful for a business. So yeah, I think things are changing. And and Paul, do you see that marketers' budgets gets reduced or, or they need a smaller amount of money in order to be in order to target their their most important accounts? Do you see a reduction in ad spend when companies kind of go down this route? Or or re or that doesn't really change? It, it can, because again, if we, if we go back to the analogy I had before, that you've got a million a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars and you just throw it here, there and everywhere, 50% of that's wasted, right? So if you could concentrate on just going after that 50% that was makes sense, there's a there's a reduction. Now, if you, if you do it right, you would probably be in a scenario that, okay, I'm only going to advertise to those 200 companies, no one else. They're the only companies I can sell to as a business. So let me focus just on those. But then within that, if you see a buyer, you know, we talked about intent signals, 
If you say a buyer within that organization who is showing really relevant behavior and intent signals, I actually want to bid higher to get in front of that person. I want the brand to be you know, known and, and trusted within that organization. But if there's buyers showing relevant buying signals there, I want to bid higher to get in front of them. So that, that, I mean, that dynamic advertising is, is hugely effective because I can sit there and say, oh, that business is a market. Let's get in front of anyone who shows relevant signals. That person is all over that particular subject or researching, whatever it may be. Let's bid high and get in front of them. I, I know we haven't got time to cover a multitude of subjects, but that's a really interesting sideline really is a lot of people get transfixed on going after a particular persona. So I, I want to sell to the CMO and I've got a message that's really relevant to the CMO. That's great. But in the real world, the CMO may be extremely busy and say to a couple of his cohorts, go and find me the three best, I don't know, marketing automation systems, shortlist that and then come back to me and I'll get involved. If you're waiting for the CMO to show buying signals, you may miss all of the signals coming from those other people and therefore never get on that shortlist. So when the CMO gets involved, it's too late. So you really want to be focusing down on, is that a relevant business? Are they showing relevant buying signals? And if so, get in front of them with, with that messaging rather than, as I say, let's throw loads of ads here, there and everywhere and hope some of it hits someone relevant. Got it. Got it. I love it. I love the, the, the targeted mantra that you are you're pushing forward and and the um the, the level of detail let's talk about abx and I, I, I specifically want to touch on what are some of the areas that you see abx being most helpful i mean maybe maybe at the beginning it would be worth defining abx because i think it's a term that has been used a lot more in the uk and a lot more in the us but not potentially as much in the apac region so let's Let's first, you've touched on it earlier, you mentioned ABX, but let's break it down and, and, and talk about what you mean by ABX. Yeah, and I think we can, again, keep this simple layman's terms, uh, I, I think. And I think maybe the reason ABM ha had some issues, certainly talking to salespeople, is because it had that M in it, right, marketing. And as we said before, that account-based approach is for anyone go-to-market, sales, marketing, lead gen, demand gen, et cetera. So I think... That's the first big difference between what was ABM and what is ABX. It, it ensures that alignment between the sales and marketing. Both teams are focused on the same accounts. They're aligned on messaging. And while sales are focused on that known buyer committee, marketing are giving that same message to the wider buying committee. The, the sales teams just will never get effort or, or insight on. I think that's the, that's the first thing. It's aligning all of those go-to market people. I think the second thing, which is equally as key, is the X really comes in from customer experience. And, and what we mean by that is if you're uh, right at the beginning of your buyer journey, you're just starting to research a topic, whatever it may be, probably one of the worst things I could do is give that to my salespeople and say, right, reach out to that person. They started showing an in interest. It's far too early in the buyer journey. At that stage, what you need to be doing is giving some brand confidence get them trusting your brand that can help you because you understand the space you understand those problems and so the, the experience or the x if you like in abx really comes from customer experience and aligning it with a buyer journey where someone is on the buyer journey you give completely different messaging that's something that marketing know and sales know but having this abx approach and identifying those buying signals early and then being able to have the right message at the right time. And that stage three in your process, whatever it may be, you see, okay, they've now come to our website. People have started engaging. They've started reading white papers. Now the time is to involve sales and get them in, into the process. And then sales come in. It tells two things. One, from a customer experience perspective, it's great because I'm getting all this brand messaging. I'm getting confidence in that brand, but I'm not being sold to yet because I'm not ready to be sold to. So I'm getting confidence that this is a company I could work with. From a sales perspective, if you can get into the routine of knowing when sales ask you to get involved in an opportunity, they already know your USPs. They understand and trust your brand. They're starting to get the value of it. I'm going to have much more effective conversations. I'm going to be working with companies that know us and trust us. And therefore, my time to close that deal is going to be much quicker. I'm going to be able to hold up those average order values we spoke about earlier. And my close rates are going to go up because I'm not being introduced into an opportunity until it's the right time. So that, that, that was a million miles high level overview of ABX. It's bringing all those account based approaches across all of the teams and then aligning them with that customer experience that means 
at the right time will engage the right message with the right people in that business to be much more effective. Paul, on this journey to kind of get to this level, because this is a quite a sophisticated level to get. I mean, the, the tech is one thing, but also just the coordination internally within the company. There is a lot of work to get there. What are some of the mistakes that you've seen people make on their journey to get to, you know, this nirvana of uh, sales and marketing alignment and basically revenue strategy? Yeah, and that, that's a huge point, right? And I think one of the biggest evolutions, I, I've been in this space for seven years. I, I'm a 20-year marketing MarTech veteran, senior old person, whatever you like to say. But in the last seven years, I think a, ABM has changed dramatically. And I think what one of the biggest things is ABM was always seen, or ABX as we're going to call it now, it was always seen as this strategy consulting deliver, uh, resource heavy based thing that took forever to build out a, a profile on a business and then build out microsites and then build out a strategy and then build some creative and do it on a one-to-one -one basis. It was slow. It was very effective, but very slow and seen as something that just worked for the, the, you know, the very few companies that had the time, budget and resource to do that sort of thing. It's evolved over this, the last few years to be something that with the uh, uh, advancements of technologies, I'm going to say like demand base, it's given that ability to actually do these things a lot quicker and scale them. And, and so to your point, I think where, where organizations often make a mistake is they go, right, I'm going to do account-based experiences. Now, that's it. ABX is my thing. And they go and find a piece of tech and think that's it, done. Technology is a key part of it. But strategy is equally as important. And I think it's it, it, there's often discussions around what is it? Is it strategy? Is it technology? It is an important combination of both. And I think what's really interesting is where you start. And, and if you start your building out your plans and your strategies without having any insight on the data, without understanding what your ICP is, if they're in market, what buying signals they're showing, where they're showing those signals, et cetera, your strategy is based on guesswork. So our view is that you always do need to start with a certain amount of technology. And that technology really should be whatever the building blocks you need to then build an effective strategy and then go and build the technology you need around it. So uh, that sounded a bit mumbly, but what I mean is there are some really powerful ways of identifying that strategy. So let's have a look at what our ICP looks like. What is, what's an ideal company for us the size of the business, the industry, the region, where we as a business can sell. That's step one. Then are those companies in market? And if they are, what buying signals are they showing that are relevant to us right now? Okay, we've got that. So we can see what companies that are a good fit are in market right now. How and if they're engaging with us is the next thing we really need to do to start building our strategy. So let's see if they're anonymously coming to our website. Have we got any insight on them within our CRM marketing automation system. So we've got some knowledge of the known audience in there. Are they replying to our corporate email? Are they talking to sales at this stage? So all of that first piece is critical, really, to say, okay, I now have the data that enables us to build a strategy. So if someone said to me, okay, before I do anything else, what do I need? You need that data. And to get that data, you do need an element of technology to get the offsite intent, to get the, the engagement be that with sales, with that, with your corporate email, with your events, with your website, et cetera, because then that allows you to identify. So for instance, you might say, there's a hundred companies there. I know I can sell to 40 of them have never been on our website. They've never spoken to sales. They have no idea who we are. If I don't reach out to them with some relevant messaging, we're going to lose them. We're going to miss those opportunities completely. There you go. There's a strategy. Some companies that need some awareness. We need to do a targeted marketing advertising campaign to those companies. There may be another group that are showing those buying signals and they came to your website, they came to the homepage, bounced and never got any further. Right, okay, well we now need to find a way of improving that experience when they arrive on our website. So that's an engagement strategy for those companies. There may be other companies that have come to your website, they've seen staff, they started a conversation with sales and they've gone cold. Okay, we now need to work with sales there to help them because they got to stage three of the buyer journey. They haven't got any further. What content do we have in our system that we can start reaching out to that business that's going to get them from stage three to stage four? So it's then obviously you've got that and then you've got the strategy in place. Then you say, right, how do we advertise to these people? How do we personalize our website? And then technology comes in again. So it's really a, a combination of both. But I think if you try to build a strategy 
and a plan without having any insight on what your existing prospects, your future prospects are doing today off your site, what they're doing, engaging with you on your site, with your salespeople, with email, etc. It really is, well, let's cross our fingers and hope and throw a load of money at it, and it may not be effective. So I think it's really, step one needs to be having the data to make the correct plans and strategies. Otherwise, you might just throw good money after bad. Got it, got it, got it. Interesting. So yeah, that, that initial stage is really understanding that firmographic information, getting an understanding of intent, and then looking at kind of attribution of, of accounts of like what is happening with these accounts that we're going after and really build from there going forward. Um, got it, got it, got it, got it. Now, Paul, this has been a great conversation and I have a few rapid fire questions that I want to take you through. But before I go there, is there anything else on ABM, ABX, and also, you know, some of your advice for marketers, what to do in these, in these times, anything that, that maybe I didn't ask, we didn't cover that you want to bring up? I, I don't think so. I think we've had a good conversation and, and, and hopefully this will be the first of many. I'm more than happy to come back and do, do further ones and, and, you know, go into specific areas in more detail if you want. I think my, my message would, would be, as I, I think as I started, you know, we're in a, a time where potentially budget resource time is being reduced. We haven't got so much of it. We need to be more effective with it. So just let's change those old methodologies of throwing just money here and hoping something sticks. The whole view of B2B should be, don't think about it as account-based marketing or account-based experience. Think, in it, think of it as, well, that's what B2B should do because we can only sell to a finite number of companies. So let's just spend all time, effort and resource there and not waste our time anywhere else. And let's not blindly go into, oh, I think that's probably what we should do because that's what we did last year. Understand the data to understand a strategy because it's going to be much more effective and we'll all deliver better results at the end of the day. I love it. I love it. All right. First rapid fire question. What is one resource? This could be a book, a blog, a podcast, a talk, whatever it is that has fundamentally changed the way you work or live. Paul, what do you, what do you have? Well, this, this obviously is a, a podcast series that I would ask everyone to, to get involved in and follow because it's very good. <laughs> Some of this evolved during COVID is podcasts. And I'm not actually going to pull, pull out or call out any individual one because I think there's so many different ones. Some you agree with, some of you don't, but they're all effective. So I would say anyone in this space, just take the time to look at the podcasts out there and, and pick and, and, and choose what you like, what you don't. But it's, it's a fantastic way when you're out for a walk or whatever you're doing, or if you've got 10 minutes spare and you don't know what to do, just dig out a, a podcast and listen to it because there's little snippets. Even old people like me are still picking up invaluable insight every day. And, uh, and I, so I, I won't pick out a particular one, but podcasts definitely for me are a, a massive source of insight. Love it. Question number two, if you could give only one advice to B2B marketers, what would it be? I'm going to sound like a, a broken record now. If you're using B2C tactics and, and that example I used about the spray and pray advertising and blindly accepting an anonymous CTR as a, as a sign of success, stop now. You're wasting money, you're fooling yourself and you're, and you're not doing the best thing you could do for the company. Question three, Paul. Who are some of the influencers in this space that you follow closely? I know you didn't want to mention any names when, when it came to podcasts, but you, you have any influencers that you follow? Well, I'm not going to be biased on this. I am completely, actually. It's, it's our own CMO, John Miller. He's, uh, he was founder of Marketo and Engageo. And what he doesn't know about ABX really isn't worth knowing. So I think he is, uh, he is one of those people that uh, from afar I've always admired. And now I'm working with him on a day-to-day -day basis. That, you know, you just have a conversation with him and you learn something new. So he's definitely one that I would, would, uh, would put down as an influencer. And someone not necessarily in the space, but it's just... Something about his voice and his calm nature. It's Simon Sinek. I don't know if that's one that you've ever come across, but he just seems to... The first time I heard him, he had a, a thing around the why. And I know the why is something that lots of people talk about, but he, he just has a really amazing way of putting across his points in a, in a calm but amazingly effective way. So that's a couple for you, though. I love it. Last one, Paul. What's something that excites you about B2B today? I suppose... ABM's been around forever, and ABX is, you know, ABM with a, it was on steroids, if you like. Uh, and it's, I suppose it's only really in the last couple of years that uh, certainly here, 
the B2B businesses have realized it's not just that strategy play. It's just not that technology. It's that combination of both that deliver success. So we're seeing so many people who have almost been hamstrung. to They don't want to get involved in ABM because they haven't got the time, budget, resource, realizing that actually with a if you start with a, a really simple piece of technology, you can get all the insight to build a much more effective strategy for your business. So I think it's it's the way it, that this this space has evolved and B2B realizing that actually B2C tactics don't work and the way that that's changing and it's accelerating quickly. So it's a very exciting time to be in this space. Paul, this has been a pretty awesome conversation and you've shared some awesome insights and I think some some great points for anyone who is facing uh, budget cuts and changes in the uh, in the environment. So I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and and thank you so much for your time. Yeah, I've loved it. It's really enjoyable. Thanks everyone who's listening and uh, and good luck with your your ABX as we go forward. Yeah, we really enjoyed the time. So thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Paul. Yes, bye bye. This episode of Growth Colony was produced by Alexander Hipwell. It was edited by Dave Samito, with additional editing and music arrangement also by Alexander Hipwell. Special thanks to Tina Wabe, Liza Maywald, and Rod Hoda. We couldn't make this show without you. The show is hosted by Shaheen Hoda. Don't forget to pick up your copy of the State of Account-Based Marketing APAC Report at abm.xgrowth.com.au forward slash report. That's abm.xgrowth.com.au forward slash report. Or just hit the link in the podcast description to get your copy. Thanks again for all the support and look forward to you joining us again in the next one.